applications. Um, these capabilities are offered on one platform, uh, on one data model and one architecture. And some of the core capabilities include a workflow automation engine. Uh, what the workflow automation engine enables you to do is take processes that were previously manual or took a you know, very long time to actually go through and, and track. So these are processes that were either tracked through uh, email or word of mouth or through phone calls. Um, things were, that were done very manually with the workflow engines, you're actually able to take these processes and digitize them and automate them. So now you're gaining visibility into these processes. You can start to standardize how work moves through your organization. And then you can improve the overall quality of service that you're providing over the course of the work transitioning through those workflow steps um, because you're now able to gain that kind of elusive visibility that you didn't have before. A configuration management database or CMDB, which is the second core capability that you see here, is a system of relevance. What, what that means is that the CMDB takes all the information about your business services, the applications that support them, the users, roles, and groups that are using these applications, and it combines the information into kind of a central uh, repository that can relate to all the information together. And what that enables you to do is look at your business service from a holistic viewpoint and say, you know, when my business service is going down, what are the actual applications that are potentially affecting this business service? Where can I start to do my root cause analysis? Where can I uh, you know, find out who exactly the users are who are being impacted and make sure that the overall level of service um, for my end users of the application um, and make sure that the overall quality is, is being maintained. So that's what the uh, um, workflow and integrations capabilities and the CMDB capabilities really bring to the platform. And, for any healthy service implementation, these are really the key uh, capabilities are, uh, of importance. There are several other core capabilities available on the platform, including a knowledge base, which enables you to bring that kind of institutional knowledge, tribal information that would have otherwise been silos uh, within the organization and enables you to expose that across the organization. So you're really able to leverage this useful information to, to help not only your end users, but also your frontline workers and your uh, executives and stakeholders within the organization. So everyone's kind of benefiting from the common shared knowledge base. You also have a service catalog that helps you organize the common services that are provided to your end users. So you can track what sort of business services you're exposing and also the experience that your end users or customers may be having. All these core capabilities are really building blocks for applications that are built on top of the ServiceNow platform. And we talk, when we talk about applications that are built on ServiceNow, we kind of talk about them along three workflow pathways. They could be IT workflows. These are things like your classic service desk operations or managing the operations around your business services. You can also talk about them in terms of employee workflows. How do you manage onboarding or offboarding, um, the changes that occur in your employees' day-to-day -day lives. And then we also talk about the customer use case. We understand that not every use case is going to be an IT use case, right? You might have customers that are external to your organization who also need a service provided to them. So this really enables you to deal with that external case management and ensure that they are also receiving a high quality of service. Now there's over 50 applications offered by ServiceNow along these three workflows um, that are built out of the box using these underlying capabilities. And these are all extendable and are all configurable with the no code, low code platform. But what ServiceNow also enables you to do is to use the app engine, which is going to be really central to our discussion today, to extend those capabilities and build your own applications if your means or business use cases don't exactly fit what's already offered by the existing applications. Now, where does ServiceNow fit into your overall architecture, to your overall business? Well, ServiceNow recognizes it's not going to be your only system of record. You likely have many existing platforms or legacy applications that have valuable information that you want to be able to leverage in these workflows. ServiceNow acts as that kind of connective tissue to bring out the information of importance from those applications, expose them through the now platform and through the workflows um, that you're now digitizing, and expose those through multiple different channels to your end users, driving great experiences either through mobile applications, through a web browser, or through conversational agents like Microsoft Teams or Slack chat. So this is kind of like the overview of where ServiceNow fits in as a platform and the capabilities and applications that ServiceNow provides. Now the focus for today's discussion is really going to be on this app engine piece. How do we use these core building blocks to build out pretty complex applications that more closely track and map to your business use cases? 
Now I'll pause there for any questions. And if there are none, I will go ahead and pass them over, pass this over to Michael for the next portion of the discussion. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, as, as Venkat was saying before, when it comes to the app engine itself, this is really where we get a lot of power of the ServiceNow platform itself. So before I completely get into a demo, I just have a few slides I want to cover to really highlight a lot of our messaging and where we've really been driving towards um, over the past few years, uh, especially since I started working on the platform in 2011. So I saw it even prior to the uh, Aspen days. Um, Back in, back in the day itself when it was really just more of an ITSM product. Um, but that being said, we never lost the vision of what uh, Fred Luddy had originally established. So the founder, Fred Luddy, had the idea of setting up a platform that could allow people to build applications to help facilitate work through workflow, uh, work through an enterprise. Uh, and so that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing Vincon's screen. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my own to get into a lot of the fun stuff. And so really uh, one of the key areas that we've been growing and maturing and really starting to bring a lot of value to various agencies and bureaus um, in, in the government itself is being able to take what used to be a very lengthy process for being able to build applications. And you know, back in the day, if you wanted to build an application, you had to set up your database server or application server. Um, you, know, you had to set up something to, to be able to serve out through REST web services. Uh, and it really just had this full, you know, IT type of stack that had a lot of overhead. You had to spend more, a lot of time getting the infrastructure in place just to build an application. Uh, of course, with cloud, we've seen a lot of improvements and, and being, being able to be more agile around there. Now we can spin up virtual servers quickly and databases and cloud databases. Um, but the one challenge comes into even with the various cloud technologies that we have out there, most of the time they're still each piece of the stack is still separate and you still have to build some kind of integration or something to have that. From the ServiceNow perspective, um, we provide that entire stack itself from that no low code aspect. And so when it comes to being able to build the applications themselves, instead of taking what used to be months or years, now can take days or maybe weeks at most to go ahead and deploy applications. Um, the COVID crisis itself has really put a, I want to say put a highlight or spotlight on the need for for agile development um the state of washington for example when we covid first hit and they had to get notifications out to their citizens as well as starting to manage the crisis itself um, they actually came to us in and my previous team a solution innovation team worked with them to uh, support them in the design and development of, of a service now application so they could go ahead and manage that the great thing is the state of washington said hey we love you guys thanks for your help um, we just asked that whatever we built, you make available to other people. And that became the initial release of the, of the COVID crisis management apps that came out available for everybody in the beginning. And they did, they themselves built that application in a very short amount of time. I want to say maximum two weeks, but I think maybe about a week itself. But it was all because they didn't have to spend a lot of time on the infrastructure as well as spending time on building, writing out all the code and doing all the things that, you know, once again, still has overhead. Um, as soon as you start writing code, you're prone to human errors, and that can also take a lot of time um, just in trying to debug and get things together. But the other big thing that we've really focused on as well is taking the concept of, hey, you know, application development used to be for professional developers, but now it's going to go be more for um, various other groups themselves, uh, civilians, low-code developers, and professional IT developers. And ultimately, what we want to really be able to do is start to get into this collaborative environment where things are drag and drop, things are going to be um, uh, pre-built and um, everything is more along the lines of focus on what type of capabilities you need in an application versus what, um, what coding you need to put into it. And then the last thing I'll, I'll go ahead and say is the fact that um, we have a lot of workflows and integrations that are available as well. And so things like the machine learning, um, as well as the basic out-of-box integration with connecting critical systems are all there already. So we don't have to worry about um, how to hook different devices, uh, different capabilities up. In fact, um, our out-of-box, um, a lot of the times when we acquire a technology, we rebuild it into the platform so customers don't have to worry about those integrations. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna hit upon as well is um, the fact that one of the capabilities that we, we came out with a few years ago that we been heavily maturing uh, is the flow designer and integration hub aspects of ServiceNow. And so integration hub 
uh, pardon me, Flow Designer is the newer workflow engine that we came out with as a no low code natural language um, ability to build workflows. But the other thing that we want to make sure of is that even though we're starting to focus more on citizen developers or, or people without traditional IT development skills, um, we also do not want to ignore professional developers. And so things like the integration hub, for example, gives the subject matter experts or developers the ability to create their own custom actions or integrations that then can be reused within Flow Designer for the flows. Uh, and so the biggest part about that is making sure the ServiceNow platform is um, reusable. That way it can be extended quickly and easily. Um, people are able to um, you know, get a lot of value out of, of some of the work that they do. But then also we want to be able to make sure that uh, we can hit upon those various personas and it doesn't matter if you're a citizen developer, maybe you have some development experience um, or you're a professional developer. We, won't, we really try to focus on all those personas. And uh, in the past, it's always been a tough thing to achieve. The great thing is that um, as we've been maturing with each release, we've been getting better and better at it as well. So that's all I want to hit upon for the uh, PowerPoint itself. Um, the biggest thing is I want to make sure we get more into to the demo and, and everything that's taking on. So in the ServiceNow world, um, here I am, of course, I'm logged into an instance, but one of the powerful aspects that we have, especially as a cloud, no low-code platform, is the fact that everything is within the cloud itself or within this web browser. And so I'm not necessarily having to even create another, you know, like connection for like visuals, visual code, for example, or another IDE. This studio is readily available for me to do that. Uh, the other great thing about it as well, and this is what we started to see from other, uh, other versions of ServiceNow over the past year or so as we've matured, is the ability to start taking and walking people through various applications um, or various steps in order to build an application. And so the guided app creator is a key part of that, especially from the no low code aspect. Here I'm able to start and specify, hey, I have an application. In this case, uh, I want to go ahead and do, um, uh, I want to create an application used for uh, uh, reporting, uh, uh, sorry, just had a lost train of thought and haven't had enough caffeine yet. Um, but I wanted to create an application for being able to uh, report um, uh, policy issues, for example. So maybe I have policies or maybe I have uh, uh, various type of um, governance that I need to keep track of and I want to go ahead and, and create an application for this. The great thing about it also is that the guided app creator uh, takes us through each step. Um, from a ServiceNow perspective, I've got the ability to have security wrapped around my application so only certain people are able to go ahead and use this application. So we're very security conscious in that respect. But then also, I've got the ability to specify and say, hey, which type of experience do I want this application to have? And so is it the type of thing where I want to be able to do a workspace? And so think of it as somebody who's sitting kind of at a screen and needing to be able to just do work back and forth. Um, maybe I want to do that mobile experience as well. So the type of thing where I need to be on my mobile device and taking certain actions, or we have our, our regular out-of-box user experience um, with various forms of lists. And the out-of-box experience that, that we have as this classic is typically what we see here, where we've got our navigation on the left, we have our lists as well as our forms right here in the center. Uh, and it's pretty much you know, a standard type of, of app experience. But the great thing about it is from a ServiceNow perspective is we've got a lot of capabilities to build various different kinds of experiences. And it's all about being able to make sure that the users themselves want to use the technology. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, application, application developers have always had is they may have a great idea for an application, but if it's not a very good user experience, it's not gonna have a lot of adoption. Look at mobile devices, for example. Apple came out with the iPhone, suddenly, you know, everybody's now making all these phone, uh, phone screens, no keyboards, uh, and those sorts of things as well. Uh, one of the other areas that we get into also is the ability to, you know, take data that we already have, for example. And so um, in this case, if I'm creating a new database table, 
um, I can go through and I can create a regular table or I can even upload something from a spreadsheet. And it's very powerful because a lot of the times we bring value to various agencies and customers that they live in the, the Excel spreadsheet world. And so being able to upload a spreadsheet and have ServiceNow pull that data, automatically generate the tables for you is, is incredibly powerful because it's saving you steps and time in order to go ahead and build these applications. Um, now, I'm gonna pause here for a second. Now, while I'm taking you through the guided app creator, I've already started building an application that, that already has a lot of components put together for you. So I'm going to uh, skip ahead just a little bit and go into that application so we can start to see what this really, really looks like. Um, once we go through, yes, I'm gonna close this. So one of the applications and use cases I've been putting together here as a demo is a disability evaluation. So think of it as a case where a service member needs to go through a report to say, yes, I had a, a physical, if something physically happened to me and I need to report in a possible disability that could be going through a medical review. Um, so similar to what I just shown, I went through the same steps with Guided App Creator. I created my tables, I've got my fields, and this is what we have now in our studio. If you see here on the left hand side, there's all these different items that are created. And this just goes to show you how much really goes into building an application because we've got it set up for a mobile application now. We've got it set up for um, the ability to um, have various workflow as well as the workspaces. But just from that guided app creator, it created all of this for me. In fact, I've got my table set up with disability request. And the great thing about this table is I already have the REST API connected to it automatically. And so because of that, um, I have, I'm able to save a lot of time when it comes to building uh, applications because the REST API is done for me. Um, I've got my REST API, I've got my tables. I, whenever I create my form and add in a new, um, when, and add in a new field, it goes and creates it on the database for me. But it's also done in such a way that um, we wanna make sure that, here we go, I'm gonna get into that later, but it's also done in such a way that um, everything's automatically for me and also easy to use. So in this case, I've got my table of a disability request. There's a lot of fields here, but that being said, I can just go to a, my wonderful form designer, which outlines all the various type of data that I have available for it, as well as lets me organize some of what I have. Um, one of the key aspects that ServiceNow also helps to bring value with is the fact that central to the architecture, we have a table called task. And the task table is exactly that. It's there to manage um, different uh, tasks assigned to somebody, and that includes data of who it's assigned to, maybe a start date, end date, and various data components that you know, are very common with needing to get work done. And so one of the things that we can do is extend that task table where I've got the ability to take all that existing uh, existing architecture and instead of having to create all these new fields over and over again it's just going to have it populated for me and that's what I did in this in this evaluation as well so I've got all these fields that are available to me I, I can use them if I want I don't have to use them but also more importantly if I want to create a um, a new field such as maybe being able to say hey let's give a, a um, brief category for example well that can be a basic string field Oops, my mobile device is really wanting to be in the middle of my screen. That's kind of funny, actually. Um, where I can go ahead and say, hey, I want to also maintain a category for, for the disability as well. I'm going to give it a name. Maybe I even have some choices um, in terms of what I'm going to do with it. Maybe it's like major, minor. And I'll get rid of this third one right here. And then I'll do save. And now, with my form designer, it's automatically going to my database and creating the field. It's going through and creating all those options for me. It's creating the REST endpoint and it's done all automatically for me. So I'm not worrying about how to actually do that. All I'm worried about is what I need. I put it into the system and it's there. And then if we go back to here and just take a look and see what this form looks like, there it is. There's my new category, my drop downs, um, and it's very easy to do. Um, like I said before, REST endpoint is there. So if I do integrations, it's already available to use. Um, well, it's great to have data. It's great to have forms. Um, the other big question comes into 
how do we go through and start to make this available for people to even submit various type of, of maybe requests? And that's where ServiceNow comes in with, with our service portal. And so ServiceNow itself as a platform, we have several different components already there and available. And one of them uh, is also our service portal. So every single instance environment can have one or more portals. You can create several of them if you want. And it is a place for somebody to be able to go and um, request various items. Uh, in this case, I've got a service portal set up. The great thing about the service portal itself is it's also, um, it's also responsive. So if I want to go to, for example, mobile, it shows up great on mobile. It can be shown through a... Uh, uh, shown through our native mobile app as well, and it makes it very flexible so that way we can go ahead and and um, build once but deploy and show multiple areas. Uh, and so in it, in this case, for example, I've got my, uh, I want to go ahead and put this form into my service portal. And so the great thing about that is, once again, if I go to my studio here, I've got a quick link that will go through and say, hey, add this to my service catalog. And all I need to do is pick and say, hey, which fields do I want to put over? Maybe a short description. Maybe I want to do a service member. I can choose exactly which category that's going to go to. And then I can save this and it you know, magically shows up. And it pretty much looks like this type of thing right here. I think I have... I hope it should show up at least. There we go, quest something. No, there we go. My search just wasn't completely bringing it up quickly. But I've got the ability to say, hey, who's a service member? In this case, I can say it's, it's I think Henry Arnold, if I remember correctly. There we go, date of occurrence and maybe a description. And you also notice I'm only getting a, a few elements of data as well. Um, part of the experience, we don't want to inundate people with asking them for too much information. We only want to get um, specific in terms of what they have. And so now we have a very easy way to go through and show that in terms of being able to select it um, and have that entered into the system. And then it can go through and kick off the process. The other thing that we have from it as well is just the ability where now that shows up in mobile automatically um, and it's readily available. But, you know, having a form is great. Having input is great. The next question comes to, hey, what about just being able to manage my workflow? And that's one of the key areas. As ServiceNow has really come up in this, um, the idea with it is not only do we have data in the environment, but we want to go through and uh, manage that data, assign tasks. And so that's where we start to come into what we call Flow Designer. Uh, and so I already have a flow created. And so if I'm looking at my studio, that's got all my list of items available. I can go ahead and bring up an existing flow. And in this case, I've got a flow set up. So that way, whenever a uh, disability request comes in, uh, it can kick off. And now I can take various different types of actions with it. So first action I may have is, for example, maybe doing a task to somebody. So I can go ahead and create a, uh, a new record that's gonna be related to this one that got kicked off. In this case, I have a, um, I think I called it a disability task. So I have another, uh, oh, evaluation task, there we go. So I have another um, task related list to it or task related data to keep track of somebody who needs to go ahead and do some work with it. And then I can go ahead and say, well, you know, my assignment group, uh, maybe a medical evaluation board. Uh, and then also I wanna relate this to it. So I've got a uh, disability evaluation and that's going to be my existing record right there. And then I can go ahead and just have done I've now got the ability to easily say, hey, let me save it. You know, got to save every five to 10 minutes going back to the 90s. And let me go ahead and just do maybe a test on this and run the test and then I can see uh, what happens with it. And so the one aspect about it is number one, I'm building logic, uh, business logic, if you will, without coding. 
All I did was put the conditions and then some of the activities. And then the number two, I'm able to easily test and see what happens as it goes through. So in this case, I can see that a record got created. Very simple, you know, it's not anything too crazy. But, you know, now it starts to come into, well, what if I want to do some other things with this, uh, with this uh, record itself? So, you know, do, being able to create tasks and assign things to a group for work, that's great, that's fantastic. But what if I need to interact with various other systems? And so this is where Integration Hub starts to come in now. So Integration Hub is our central place that where we can connect to various other types of technologies. Also gives me these additional actions in my flow designer where I can say, hey, I want to take an action against something. That could be uh, uploading a file to the box, for example. Maybe I'm using Box as an archive. Um, maybe it's something like going through and creating something in JIRA if, if I'm doing maybe software development. Um, or maybe it's even extending out ServiceNow itself where I'm going to create a PDF as part of, of a custom uh, integration that I have. Um, but also I can call various other systems, be it a existing system or a custom system. Um, we can even see success factors here, Slack, Microsoft Teams, and just a whole bunch of different out-of-box integrations that we have. In fact, if you're looking for a ServiceNow integration to see if we've got something out of box, um, I recommend to go to our store, store.servicenow.com. Everything that we created for these spokes will be out there. Anything partners create will be out there. And it's a great way to, um, to go ahead and uh, see what we have readily available. In this case, uh, I want to do something probably not quite related to a disability evaluation, but I'm going to do it nonetheless. Um, I have a, a kind of mock-up API, if you will, where I want to go ahead and order some food. I'm, you know, maybe doing a lot of work makes me hungry. Uh, and so, you know, maybe I want to order food for somebody who's doing some of the work related to the evaluations. And so, once again, it's no low-code aspect of it. I'm able to easily go through and say, hey, I want to be able to say, well, my location is going to be the person who's doing the work and that's going to be the assigned to and they're in a location. So I'm going to deliver it to them. Um, I'm going to order them one pizza. I guess I could do a dozen donuts and I can go ahead and mark that done and save and test it out. And so now I'm calling an API that's using a REST API to go out there, do food ordering and automate it as well. And so the biggest thing is, you know, we're now interacting with various systems. We're able to test it. We're able to work with it based upon our use case. Um, you know, like I said, we can test to see what happens with it. And then when we're done, we're able to publish this, this flow. And then we can move on to what we want to get onto for, for the next step in our automation. Um, like I said before, the great thing about it is right now we're not touching any code. Um, but that being said, what if we do want to expand out something with code itself? What if we do want to maybe connect to a REST API or expand out some of this functionality? In fact, another great use case may come to be, so I've got this food ordering system. What happens if these items change? Like, is this hard coded? Is this something I can reach out to serve it to another environment and pull data in? The great thing is, yes, we can. Because when it comes to building these components, it's all about reusability. Uh, and so while we try to keep things no low code and a lot of building the workflow and the applications, we are also trying to meet the personas of the developers who want to really get in there and touch more code. And so a great example that I have is when it comes to this action of ordering food, I've got the ability to have this now as my custom, if you will, pro code environment. Um, it's not completely pro code. There's a lot of helper steps that we have going on, but that being said, uh, we still have the ability to run scripts as well as well as expand out on what we want to build with it. Uh, in this particular uh, custom action that I built, I'm calling a REST API. And if you notice, we have a specific REST step to be able to call that endpoint. We're putting in information about what that target's going to be. Uh, and then we're putting in the information, what we have for the various inputs as well as the outputs. Um, if you see here, I've got the ability to script. So if I am a pro coder, yes, I can still get into that and build out these custom actions. The great thing is I can build them, enhance the functionality, and then make that available for everybody else. Um, but like I said before, one of, the, one of the areas that we start to get into though is how do we make sure 
that we can build, extend the platform and make sure that it's going to be flexible so we don't have to change it in the future. Uh, and like I said before, this order food API right here could have it where, hey, maybe we're changing, maybe items or various items are gonna change. And instead of having to open this up every single time and modify our inputs where I'm changing the choices, maybe I can take an extra, extra step and say, you know what, instead of having to hard code these choices here, what if I reach out to my external system, find out what those choices are and then populate it. So that way I don't have to worry about constantly going through and updating this every time that external system changes. Um, so a lot of technologies that we integrate with, Jira, Salesforce, they could have custom fields that are created and we don't wanna have to hard code it every single time there's those changes. Um, so one of the things we have with that is something called introspection. Um, I've got the ability to have another action built out to pull additional data in. And once I do that, I can go to my inputs on here and say, you know what, let me change this to something that's going to be dynamic. And let me use a specific action that I already have created. So this is more of a, a pro code area where I have this get food option action available. And so we are getting a little bit more, more pro code, if you will, or I'm calling another REST API. But I can go ahead and say save, and I trust my work, so I'm just gonna do publish. I recommend a test, however. And now when it comes to ordering my food, if I do this option, you now see I have several different options there. Donuts, McDonald's, oh, McDonald's sounds good right now. Um, pizza, White Castle. Uh, and that is all generated from this additional step right here, going out and pulling the data in. And so now I can be rest assured that, hey, whenever there is a different, uh, whenever there is something that changes on that external system, it's great. I can go ahead and see it uh, without any problem. So, you know, I got into so far the, the aspect of building an application. We have a guided app creator. We've got the ability to create our forms, put that forms into a service catalog. That service catalog itself can be responsive. So it can be mobile or maybe it's going through our native mobile work as well. Um, and now we're on our, our flow designer, really expanding out on the different capabilities that we have available. Um, but some of the other logic that we have really in place for ServiceNow is um, various other type of capabilities such as things like decision tables. And in the ServiceNow world, we're always trying to make sure that what we build is flexible. What we, what we build you know, is able to change to whatever type of data conditions that we have. And so as we're going through and building out these flows, so to speak, and, and our logic, we've got a lot of different capabilities in the sense of, hey, if we wanna run an if statement, to, to, to do something um, based upon certain conditions, or if we want to make a decision. And decisions are very powerful because we've got these things called decision tables. Decision tables are essentially parts of ServiceNow that are set up in such a way that could have different types of input come in, and then based upon the decisions, it can have certain output come out as well. And so we're able to have complex logic, but the complex logic itself starts to end up getting um, a little simpler in terms of how we start to put it together. The other powerful thing about decision tables as well is the fact that decision tables are data driven, meaning I don't have to go through and um, check out my application, my workflow, if you will, or any other type of, of part of the service now environment um, that goes through development. I can just go in and change the different data that goes to my decision tables and then the decision tables themselves are, are going to appropriately adjust. That way it's now data driven workflows and not trying to you know hard code various logic that we have. Um, decision tables are something that's a little bit newer I think in the past year in terms of what we've come out with ServiceNow and it was really that recognition to say hey we know customers are using a lot of tables to 
essentially help drive the direction or, or maybe logic in these workflows. So why don't we just have that capability as, as a platform capability instead of people having to build all this stuff themselves. Um, Flow Designer, in, when it comes to the no low cut aspect as, as well, we talked about the integration hub, the ability to extend off those integrations. Um, and then there's also a lot of different type of, of parts of Flow Designer that we also start to get into. And so one of those areas now even starts to get into, well, what about calling subflows? And so going back to the idea that we are um, able to uh, extend out the platform itself, we could have a primary flow that is running for various type of, of um, you know, maybe various type of triggers or maybe various type of schedules, or we may want to extend out the use of the platform where we can go ahead and say, you know what, we need to go through and create a, a flood, uh, a subflow available for it. And so we've got the ability to go through and pull in extra data uh, or pull an extra type of logic based on these subflows. So that way we can start to compartmentalize what we want to build and put together. Subflows are very powerful because you can go ahead and call subflows from any part of the platform. Um, but then we also got the ability to send out um, data inputs into those, get the data inputs back, and then able to, to work with these various subflows um, and be able to, um, once again, make it compartmentalized and easy to, and modular to work with. So one of the great areas that I've been working a lot on the subflows lately comes about more from uh, what we've had, what I've had related to um, some PDF and, and box file integration as well, where uh, if I go through, I think I have it here. where I've been building out more of um, capabilities to manage box files in from the ServiceNow platform, keeping things in sync, automatically uploading it. And in this case, I also have several subflows related to it where I've got that ability to say, hey, you know, I want to call subflow. I want to uh, I want to call subflow. I want to update those, those files if it exists. And it's just taking advantage of a lot of the modularity of, of the ServiceNow platform. Um, the great thing also about when it comes to using the flow designer is the fact that not only do I have all my various conditions here for running these flows, so I can have it when something's created, I can run it for a schedule, um, I can have things related to service catalogs or maybe inbound email, but I've also got the ability to take any part of these, be it an action or flows, and put them into the ServiceNow uh, ServiceNow environment through our scripting. So um, in it, if I've got something that's published, in this case, it's an action that's published, I can go ahead and pull a code snippet, copy and paste this into any part of ServiceNow that does the, uh, that does scripting. And lo and behold, I can now call these from any part of ServiceNow itself. It's very, very powerful because once again, we're trying to stick with the idea of the no low code platform but we also are giving a lot of flexibility into you know, calling various capabilities of ServiceNow um, if, we, if we do need to touch the code. Um, and once again, one of the big reasons for that is because you know, there are a lot of no low code platforms out there, but what we've started to find out and hear back from customers are, there may be something that's very, very user friendly with no low code, but they're kind of limited in the flexibility versus we still want to have that flexibility while meeting the no low code um, aspects of it as well. All right, so I got through a lot of information in a, uh, in a fairly short amount of time. Um, what I don't know is if we have any questions that have come up before. Oh, someone's saying, well, now I'm hungry. That's fantastic, I'm hungry too. Um, Michael, so uh, we've answered a lot of the questions so far in chat, but I think one of Great. the important uh, questions that keeps, does keep coming up is uh, regarding integration. So I was wondering if you could, uh, I don't know if that fit exactly fits in with this, within this discussion, but if you could maybe touch on just how integrations are done with ServiceNow really quickly, um, that might help give some kind of overview guidance to, uh, to folks who have questions around that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, you know, with integrations itself and Integration Hub, it's kind of interesting because we talk about flow designer as a capability and integration hub as a capability for, for managing all those integrations. In reality, 
um, Flow Design and Integration Hub are pretty much, I almost want to say, almost a single product in the sense of a user experience because all these integrations that we have are all these actions in Flow Designer. Um, or also known as the spokes, it's kind of that logical unit to be able to say, hey, this is, this is uh, something that here that, that we have. So um, we've got the ability to um, use out-of-box integrations. And so if I load up a certain spoke, I may see it over here under my installed spokes where I can say, well, you know what? I want to do something with um, Jira, for example. I want to go through and you know, build a table here. Oh, I don't have a lot of actually activities there. Or maybe I want to do something with box. There we go. I'm going to look up a file ID. Here's my inputs that I have for my file ID, and then I can, and then it'll reach out to box and then go ahead and, and pull that information over. But the big question comes to, well, what if I, what if I have something I want to integrate with and we don't have it out of box? Great, that's no problem. That's where in Flow Designer we can say, hey, let's create a new action. Let's call this my new integration. And we can go ahead and set up to say, you know, I have some inputs. Um, maybe it's something more along the lines of, um, uh, I just had a blank of what, in terms of what I'm doing. So maybe I'm doing something where I need to send over a user ID as an input. Um, but then also I can say, okay, what's the next step in my integration here? So I'm getting some inputs, maybe a user ID. And then what do I want to do in terms of my integration itself? Do I want to call a, REST API, do I want to call maybe a JDBC database? Um, what do I want to do? And so now this is where, and of course this is where I start to say Flow Designer is kind of integral to the integration hub because we're really an integration hub now. We're calling an integration, we're reaching outside of service now, but I'm using the Flow Designer UI to build it. And so I always say, I always kind of explain, well Flow Designer and integration hub really are almost the same thing. The only big difference is as soon as you reach out, you're using Integration Hub. Um, and in this case, I'm, I'm determining what I want to do. Um, I could be calling a REST API, and we've got the ability to set up pre-built REST API endpoints. Um, in this case, I've got a, a, a API endpoint for Jira. Um, there's my REST. API base URL that was pre-configured. I can also build something like that's inline. So I can just define my own connection in terms of what that's gonna look like. Um, let me go back to Jira here. But here I am for my Jira environment. Um, I can put together the request through using an open API if I want, or I can build this request manually. And then I can go ahead and start to put in my query parameters. I'm trying to remember, I think it was something like JQL. Ah, now, you, now you got me on a good one. If I look up my current Jira one, I can just copy and paste it. Here we go. So uh, here we go. My user input Jira ID, my rest step that I had before, I'm connecting to Jira. I'm using a get. So I can put, put my HTTP, HTTP method. In this case, I'm using a specific user ID. And I'm then doing some scripting to go ahead and parse out the payload itself. Now, um, we have an out-of-box XML parser already for the current release of ServiceNow, which is Orlando. Um, I will say for Safe Harbor, and I think it is code complete, but I'll say for Safe Harbor, it's my understanding the next release of ServiceNow is also supposed to have a JSON parser. Um, please let me check and confirm that though. Don't hold it to me completely, but I know it was on the roadmap. Um, but the biggest thing is the fact that we're trying to make it easier and easier to work with everything. So in this case, I'm calling a REST step, and then I've got to parse it out. In this example, I just did some scripting to parse it out. It's not too difficult using JavaScript. So if you're a pro coder, it runs great. Um, and we already have the step to call the, the REST API itself. And then of course, I can run a test just to see what happens. In this case, I think I have admin and I can see exactly how the data comes through and processes. And so now I've got this integration built where I'm taking a specific input, I'm calling a JIRA environment, my demo environment, and I'm getting my data back. And I can see what the schema looks like. It's kind of ugly, but you know, I can still see it. I can see the, the uh, response status. 
And now I can go through and start to leverage this integration. And I can do it in a few different places. I can do it in a flow. So I can take another flow and call this as a step. Um, or another area that I've really started to get into as well has been remote tables. So remote tables are wonderful because you see data that's in an external system without saving it in ServiceNow. And in this case, I have my JIRA stories that I'm populating and this code right here, that looks kind of ugly, I'll admit, is just simply from this right here. So I just copied and pasted this out, put it into my, my script area there that I have for my remote table and boom, I got my data. Now, when I have my JIRA remote table, Well, it's not showing me because I don't think I have any. As, as that user, Michael Slobonic, I don't have any data, but if I over switch over to admin, I now have it. So I'm leveraging Integration Hub. I use Flow Designer to build out the integration. Um, integration Hub is the piece that's being called. And then I, in this case, I used my remote tables to actually call that action step to, to populate my, my JIRA data itself. And like I said, it's kind of neat. This is a remote table because the data is not being stored on the database. And so, um, Flow Designer and Integration Hub as our, our newer capabilities over the past couple of years. Um, we've had other integration mechanisms in the past, but going forward, the roadmap is to keep building out the maturity and integration capabilities within the Flow Designer UI. And so when it comes to all the improvements, for example, the JSON parser I talked about, um, that's going to be here. Um, any other new integrations that may be connecting to various data sources, that's going to be here. Um, and so it's worthwhile that if you're if you're someone who's got a lot of older integrations, it's worthwhile to start looking at number one, building your new integrations here in Flow Designer and Integration Hub, and then number two, looking to see when you should start migrating things over because this interface is far easier to work with um, and faster and, and easier to build as well. I can test it out. Once I'm done, I can publish it. I can put it in flows. I can call it from the script and um, just a lot of capability. So I hope that answered your question around the integrations because uh, that's a big one I get in a lot of conversations. All right, so we're getting, well, a few minutes left, this is great. So we've got on the integration aspect in terms of, hey, we've got Flow Designer set up, um, We've got uh, our application set up. Uh, we've got various integrations now. Uh, you know, what else can we do with this application? And the other great thing about the application itself, when we start to really look at a lot of the capabilities, we now start to get into some more of even our machine learning um, or maybe our virtual agent itself. And so, as I said before, this is a studio. This has got everything related to what we want to build in our application. And so the great thing about the ServiceNow platform is you don't have to use, you're not forced to use specific components. You can really pick and choose what you want to use. And the other thing to keep in mind is all the applications ServiceNow provides are actually all, um, all available in the platform aspect itself. So every application you use, be it IT or HR, it's using these components. It's already there. And so maybe as your application matures, you want to go through and start to do something like a virtual agent. Oh, do I have my agent chat on there? Oh, yes, I don't. Or maybe I want to start to do uh, machine learning as well. And so I've got everything available to me in terms of what I want to do for my virtual agent, like creating a topic. And in this case, with my application, I can create a topic um, and that then has its own uh, that then has its own responses, maybe its own logic, maybe it's using some of the server side coding. Uh, and I'm able to expand out the application itself. So I'm not stuck in just the idea of, hey, let me just have an application where I've got a form-based application with workflow. I now can start taking advantage of these other aspects of the platform. Virtual agent, for example, machine learning. Um, you know, this is small talk to topic. Um, and that way I can really start to consider how do I want to expand out, um, how do I want to expand out my application? How do I want to improve the user experience? Some applications themselves or some users, uh, and I've done a lot of this with human centered design, some users don't want to sit there on a computer screen with a form. Um, some people want to be mobile. 
great. How do I expand out my mobile application for this? Some people like the virtual agent chat. Um, I was on the chat the other day to Disney World asking when I can buy a season pass. Um, you know, virtual agent itself could have automatically answered that question for me without having to, you know, take the time of an agent. Um, and so we're really always trying to consider, you know, how can we expand out the various applications through through the various use cases. Um, you know, mobile itself is another big one as well. Um, uh, you know, I know on the uh, in the federal space itself, um, mobile is always kind of a little weary in terms of how it gets deployed. Um, the great thing is, it's my understanding also, we're, we're looking at deploying mobile on, I think, in the FedRAMP as well. So if you're a FedRAMP customer, great. That's going to be coming. I'm not going to say when. Talk to We can always have talk to your product manager about it. But um, it's taking advantage of all this around here to build these applications. And uh, we're actually a few minutes uh, close to the end of our time here. Did anybody have any other questions or were there any other questions available? I'm um, just reviewing the questions right now. And it looks like most of the answered ones, we've uh, kind of tagged them for follow-up. So at this point, it doesn't look like there's any more. Uh, I'd be happy to stay online to uh, you know, monitor the Q&A to see if there's any additional ones. But uh, in the meantime, thank you very much, Michael, for uh, the presentation today. I think that was extremely informative. And I, I know that we're going to get uh, a lot of folks who are interested in, in you know, creating their own custom applications going from here. Absolutely. And I'll definitely throw it out there. One of the things that my team uh, like, loves to do uh, is we call them innovation workshops. And so if a agency group customer has some ideas for what they would want for an application, we can actually come in for a day and um, sit down with various teams, build the application, and uh, even, you know, sometimes we make it like a competition as well. Um, you know, we don't get anything too crazy technical, but it really gives people an opportunity to get hands on with the ServiceNow platform, as well as having some guidance, as well as some gurus there. And it's a great way to really see what you can do with the platform. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to uh, attend these sessions and to have a conversation with us and be so active with the uh, question and answer and chat. Um, I'll just let everyone know that uh, upcoming next week on our session nine is ServiceNow Security Operations, Security Orchestration, Automation and Response. I know that there was a few questions related to that during this session. So uh, very much looking forward to having everyone join us next week as well. So thank you all and thank you, Michael. Thank you. Everyone have a great day.